G'day and welcome to the Drive Able podcast. I'm Brad Williams and over there is Elliot Barium. Um, and today we're talking about the potential to drive for young adults with autism, ADHD, learning difficulties and intellectual disabilities with a driver trained OT, Jenny Gribben. She's from Queensland. Jenny uh, is the winner of the 2021 Australian Road Safety Technology Award and has introduced an assessment battery uh, for generalist OTs, for parents and clients with learning difficulties uh, and it's making a huge difference in this space. So lucky to have her on. We have seen a massive influx over the NDIS lifespan for assisting clients with autism especially, but also learning difficulties. Um, and we can't wait to get Jenny on board today to talk to her about the assessment tools that she's introduced and all of the apps and aids that she's got available to help parents and clients out. So, Ali, should we get her on? Let's do it. Welcome to the Drive Able podcast, where each episode you get to listen to two of Australia's leading professionals in the area of driving and community mobility for people with disabilities. In each episode, they interview drivers, carers, and industry experts and share the insider's guide to driving with a disability. Here are your hosts, Brad and Ollie. Hi everyone, I'm really excited to get into today's interview, but before we get started, we just want to do a quick shout out to our sponsors who make this show possible, Mobility Engineering and Williams OT. This show takes time and money to put together, so we just wanted to say thanks to the sponsors for helping us bring you this podcast. So today we have Jenny Jenny Gribben joining us from Queensland today. G'day Jenny, how are you going today? I'm good, thanks Ali and Brad. How are you guys going? Really, oh, yeah, really we're awesome. good. And yeah. uh Let's start by introducing yourself and telling the listeners a little bit about your background experience in the field of driving assessment. Sure. Um, I'm a driving OT in Brisbane and my business is called Driving Well Occupational Therapy. Um, I've been an OT for many, many years now, since 2005, and I've um, come from working in um, background in um, hospital um, acute medical and um, community um, adult physical kind of caseloads. And I was always interested in doing um, driving assessments. I don't really, I don't really know what it was about it. I was just really, it just always sort of grabbed my attention as a young OT. And um, I decided to go and do the driving training um, in 2012. And one thing led to another and um, eventually started my own business. Um, and here we are. So that's how driving well sort of come about. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, just to let you know, I know Jenny from way back when we did uh, part of the course together, we both did, uh, I think it was the truck driving uh, assessment training together, uh, 2014, 15, something like that way, way back then. Um, so yeah, it's, we've, we've known each other for years, but you're doing uh, amazing stuff with driving well and your uh, OT driving clinic up there. Now we could go on and talk about that, but we have got you on to talk about all of the wonderful work that you're doing around ASD or autism and mm -hmm. driving and yeah. the the potential to drive assessment battery yeah. that you've um, been developing up there in Brisbane for for use in Australia. Could you provide an overview of, of what entails this potential to drive assessment battery and and uh, and why we're so excited to get you on? I might, yeah, absolutely. I might um I might take a step back and give you a bit of context around how how that sort of all come about as well yeah. because that's that's quite a special little story, really. Okay. Um, so yeah, in my, my practice, I started um, driving well. Um, it it was um around um, 2017 is when I launched Driving Well Occupational Therapy. So it was sort of really pre, just pre NDIS as NDIS was starting in um, the external areas in Queensland. And we were we were getting a lot of referrals for young people who were on the spectrum and um, ADHD 
to similar psychosocial um, disabilities, intellectual disabilities. And um, I, I didn't have that background. So my background was adult physical caseloads. I didn't have that paediatric or um, autism or, or mental health kind of background. So, and then, you know, and most of the driving OTs in my, in my, in our network here, and certainly in Brisbane, were the same. We didn't have that, that paediatric background. So we're all of a sudden getting these referrals for these young people who um, had a goal to learn to drive like every other 15 and 16 year old in the Yeah, country. that's not just Brisbane, by the way, that, that yeah. was... That was a big thing across yeah. Australia from my point of view with the NDIS rollout. Yes. All of a yeah. sudden, ASD and driving yeah. became became something that was maybe an achievable goal. Yeah, and something that they would be able to explore for the first time and be you know have that funding support to explore whether that was going to be feasible for them. So we the approach tended to be. Um, do your normal driving OT assessment. So where we've got the clinical part and the practical part, get them behind the wheel and really see how they go with with a bit of a scaffolded approach. Like they, we wouldn't get them to do everything all at once, but we'd get them to do steering and indicating and following instructions from the driving instructor. But what I found as a driving OT, so, so the way we do the driving assessment is that um, we've got that clinical part and then the practical on-road part with um, the client is usually driving within the driving instructor's dual-controlled vehicle with the driving instructor in the front and the driving OT is in the back doing, looking at assessing driving performance. And when we were putting our young, our young people, and a lot of them were doing this for the very, very, very first time, um, we were putting them in and they were getting um, complete cognitive overload and overwhelm and, and you know, se se severe anxiety. And when I was watching them trying to work out, I, I couldn't really ascertain as a therapist what their main problem or challenge areas were. So we'd get them, you know, trying to drive up a street and then to a turn left at a corner and they'd be zigzagging around the corner. And as as the OT, I didn't know, was it a spatial perception of problem? Was it um, understanding the instructions? Was it a motor coordination problem? I couldn't really tell. Um, but that's all we had. So we did what we did, what we, you know, the best that we could with what we had. Um, and we'd often set some goals and just, you know, give, give them... Um, the only way forwards was to sort of give them a go, give them a go, in inverted commas, um, with with progressing with a series of driving lessons and and then doing a review and seeing where they were up to um, after an on road review period. And basically, what I was finding was that some some clients that was still working okay, and then other clients they would develop a plateau in their learning skills, and it was they were they often were able to learn to operate the car but they were having a lot of difficulties in actually developing their observation skills and their planning skills. And they weren't able to do things independently, like they needed the driving instructor to coach them constantly through all of the steps of, um, of driving and even like basic level, low demand, low traffic. Um, and I had, I had a couple of young people that, um, that really, that happened to, and I have I have one memory of a young lady. She was and she was a bit older. She was um, around twenty one, and her diagnosis was an intellectual disability. And she had um, undergone a significant number of lessons with a specialised driving instructor. So when I say specialised, it means they've got additional skills and training and qualifications above what a regular instructor has so he had awareness of working with occupational therapists and awareness of like different techniques that he could use to to help that young person learn um and so she had done these lessons with him and it had also you know done lots of practice in really low safe controlled environments with mum um and we were at a a, um, a review um like an on-road reassessment and she just had she was one of these young people that had completely plateaued and had not progressed her her skills and wasn't showing me any more potential to learn anything beyond what she had been able to do that thus far um and that she just wasn't going to be successful in being a driver so it's essentially essentially our job as a driving OT is to look at whether that person's medical condition or disability is impacting on their ability to drive and so for that young girl her disability um was impacting on her and it was 
that she was not going to be able to be a driver. And she had put her heart and soul and guts into this. And I had to have a conversation with her to say, you've tried so hard, but your disability is impacting you. I can't recommend any more lessons. That's it. You're not going to be able to drive. And that One was of the hardest conversations to have. Those are they that are. That was gut wrenching for me, but it was you know it was devastating for her. It was mm-hmm. devastating. So we fast forward a little bit, and you know I just you know the conversation kept coming up at all of our driving network meetings. Um, it came up around conferences around the country. Like, what are you guys doing? Like, is there? And I just kept thinking, there's got to be a better way of doing this. Um, and then. Um, fast forward again to um, March 2020 and there was a little thing called the COVID pandemic that happened Um, and I mean in Brisbane we were fortunate that it was we had only um, a couple of months um, lockdown and our social distancing requirements were um, you know that limited us for only a couple of months and doing on-road assessments but basically I use that time to start to try and answer my question, is there a better way of doing these assessments? Um, and um, and particularly with the autism, because I didn't have that background, I was, you know, I wanted to understand, well, what how does autism impact on driving? What what does the research say? How can I be doing my assessment better? How can I be guiding and supporting these young people better? How can I be setting them up for success better? So um, I started just doing some research and uh, I came across an amazing driving OT, Dr. Miriam Monaghan from um, America, and she had already done all this work. So I um, I emailed her and we were on, with on, on a Zoom within a couple of days. And, um, you know, as we were trying to navigate the, the pandemic and all the lockdowns and things, she um, basically led us in um, what she had done over in the USA. Um, so she had written a book chapter on on all of this work um, and published several papers and she had um, run this workshop several times through their aided, um, their American Driving Association um, um, conferences and things over there. So basically we wrapped that up into um, a Zoom-based workshop for driving OTs and we ran that across Australia several times and so since the start of COVID we've run that um eight eight times I think so there's been more than 100 driving OTs across the country and um more than I think 30 or 40 specialized driving instructors that have done that potential to drive um training um so yeah that's how it's all happened has been my COVID silver lining to get that um that better approach and and the feedback's just been phenomenal. So everyone that's been using that and adopting that is just finding that they're getting um, such a better assessment result um, and and getting much better outcomes for their clients. Let's let's get into that because yeah. uh, I I'll give you some feedback as well. We've we've introduced uh, a lot of it into our practice as well. So thank you very Yay. much for doing the uh, the research and um just uh, off air before we came on i said that i've i've got two more staff members uh that we're signing up for uh, for the next year's the next uh, lot of training um so yeah uh awesome and 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 if anyone's watching this on youtube uh in the background of me i've put up a uh, background um behind my head uh of bruno bruno does our uh lead-in commentary our introduction um to the to the podcast so uh, the voice you heard in the intro was actually Bruno. Bruno uh, has has been with us for a very long time. Uh, ASD uh, is his uh, autism is his diagnosis, but with anxiety as well. All the things that you've just mentioned in your into your intro of what you're struggling with, and many many hours on the road, but we're able to work through the anxiety and and that plateauing effect because. That was very much the same with Bruno as well, and I'm and I'm mentioning Bruno here because he's he's given us permission to uh, uh, use him as an example for all lots of our clients to give people hope, and he's he's an amazing man with his generosity like that. Um, but like you said, that that plateauing effect, we had to work through that, and mm-hmm. then that 
release uh, from the driving instructor as well, like letting go of the driving instructor has been mm -hmm. a, a very big security thing that he's had to let go of to try and build that independence. So, mm. um, yeah, I cho chose that picture on, on, on purpose, uh, knowing about today's uh, interview with you, because there's so much to unpack in this that we won't have time to do it all. But I want to want to go through some of that training that you've got out for the OTs and some of the training that you've got out for the driving instructors um, and, and what advice that you can actually give to uh, parents and clients with ASD. So I'm going to let you lead the conversation okay. into, into Before we go on, so many questions. There's so many things. I've got a couple of questions just on the elementary side of it before we, you go on. Um, I, how, does the is the like this process that you're talking about the assessment process of um doing the lessons and learning is that funded by NDIS like so you can yes. you can be funded to the point of um so the NDIS will fund a journey where the journey may be no at the end is that correct and they'll fund the whole journey uh, not the necessarily the whole journey. Yeah. So NDIS, I just wanted to be yeah. clear on that. Um, just so that you uh, like listeners can hear, you know, what's, cause I, yeah. I would imagine there might be some quirks around getting money for that process. Yeah. Yeah. There's definitely, there's definitely a process. This it's a very, very challenging process um, through the end. It's, it's amazing that we've, that there is that funding support available, yeah, okay. but the process is really challenging yeah, and yeah. it's something that's still not managed really very well um, yeah. within the NGIS. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you really need to know the work with the right people. Like, like, cause the thing yeah. is, this is something that we've spoken about in the past on this podcast about, you know, working with the NDIS and all of the strict kind of rules mm. and just having had all of those conversations, I'm just imagining trying to get this over the line is going to be a nightmare, you know, um, and you'd have really want to know what you're doing and have the right team around you to be able to properly structure it, to get the funding, to be able to actually do all of this stuff to, to get through that process. Yeah, yeah. So I think I think the first thing to understand is that um, regardless of the NDIS, what where this is coming from is that is is that our laws in Australia around medical conditions and being able to drive. Yeah. So that's the very first thing that OTs um, driving at well, driving OTs know it. <laughs> um, 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 any other health professional, any support coordinator, any parent, any client. Um, yeah, I think I think clients, especially yeah. if you're going to have to have that hard conversation, there yeah. there needs to be really that understanding that like this journey could end without a successful result, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, you know, if you've got a, a medical, the, the, so the law in Australia is that anybody with a medical condition that may impact on their ability to drive needs to actually gain clearance from their treating doctor and report that um, to their state licensing authority. And that ver that how that how that process, what that looks like, it does vary slightly from state to state. It would be amazing if it was just the same process across the country, but it's not. Um, so for example, here in Queensland, um, the client, it's, it's, it's the driver's responsibility to do this. Um, so the the potential driver or potential driver has to get a um, it's called a Queensland Transport Medical Certificate that they need to get from their GP, um, and they need to take that to Queensland Transport um, for processing. So that certificate it, it could say um, there's a couple of different options that the GP would select from that. So it could be that they've got a medical condition but they don't need um, a restriction on their license. It could be they do have a medical condition that may impact um, and they just need a medical review, say, in 12 months' time, or it could be that they have a restriction on their licence, so they must only drive with a driving instructor in a dual control car, for example. Yeah, and look, I'll just add to that. I'm in South Australia, very mm. similar process in South Australia with different names and different... Yes. Uh, and it's going to be very similar in other states but with yep. slight little twists on it. But yeah, the yeah. medical elements... Uh, there is one document called the Osroads Medical Guidelines. Just you can actually right Google there. search that and it's yep. a free download or a free website that you can go in yep. and actually check your medical condition versus mm -hmm. the standards. And that's the same standards that doctors use, yep. that we as OTs use, uh, that 
Uh, it's like the what Ali uses for design and and engineering. It's a it's available to everybody, uh, and we all analyze that document and come up with our diagnosis and and potential based on our clinical reasoning and so forth. So, mm. Ostroads medical guidelines. Uh, go fitness and, to go drive guidelines. Yeah, medical fitness to drive guidelines. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, very very yeah. similar in in most states. And the the biggest um, the the newest part of that, so that 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 guideline got reviewed, um, and, that, and there's a whole big process to get to get that reviewed. Yep. Um, the latest review was published in June 2022, uh, and it actually has a new section in the neurological condition section called other neurological, which refers to um, it makes reference to autism and um, those other diagnoses and intellectual disability. So. So and that's the first time. That's the, that's the first in, time that it's really ever been introduced into the medical yeah. guidelines. So, with it's now coming under that umbrella of being a medical condition slash disability that may impact driving. That needs to have that clearance process. So, when a doctor is not sure about the um, the functional impact of any kind of medical condition, that's when they're then referred to an OT driver assessor to do an assessment. So. So I think that's the most one of the most important things for any of the listeners to understand is that um, you know autism is considered a disability. Autism is because it's you know it's it's, neuro, it's neurodivergence, it's neurological differences in in the brain, um, and that and the research actually sh- you know s- shows that uh, um, at a microscopic level there are different there are different changes that, that can be seen. Not, they're not the same for everybody, and everyone's going to be different in how they present and how they function but there are differences in the brain. That's why it's called neurodivergence. That's why it's a recognised disability. That's why people are able to apply to the NDIS to get supports. So, you know, to think that impact on driving is is not going to be, you know, considered. So, So sometimes I meet parents that understand their young person's disability impeccably and are aware of all of the risks. And then I meet other parents that say, well, you know, they get this support and this support and this support and this support, or they need have this help at school and they've got this job support and or they need someone to help them go to the go and access the community. But they can drive. You know, there's just such a discrepancy so there. I have a very big point I wanted to just put uh here, right at this point, if I can interrupt, because right at that point what does the poor OT do that has to have the hard conversation with a family like that and they're going to get bullied into, no, we don't accept it? How, what, what tools can they, like, do you have any tips on that? Because I would say there might be some, because I guess there, just, just to say um, a little bit of like uh, background before we started, I was pretty excited to speak to Jenny because I know Jenny quite well and I respect her and she's a bloody good OT. And she, she, she would have no problem having those conversations, but I know that there are OTs out there that don't have the experience mm-hmm. um, that would be faced with this wall of like emotion and no, this is what mm-hmm. we're going to do and blah, blah, blah. And I'd say they'd be struggling to deal with those situations, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And because driving is always so emotive, right? Like, yeah. And, and parents have usually got hopes and dreams for their child or their child has got those hopes and dreams for themselves to be a driver to be normal like like everyone else but we've just got to come back to the law so the document that that brad was just saying just now the assessing fitness to drive guidelines most um a lot of ot's i talk to are actually unaware that autism is now in those assessing um fitness to drive guidelines so you know now you know um, and that um, to you know to be using that as a tool to educate parents say well you know they've they've got these additional needs we've got these additional supports um, that um, you know that we're getting the NDIS for that they're meeting the NDIS criteria so there's there's got to be things that you know there's got to be impact significant enough to actually be eligible to get the NDIS that we've got to be realistic and safe and safety, 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 safety is going to trump everything. We don't want anything to happen to your young person that you need to understand that driving is actually a really, really, really complex task and that the things that we're seeing over here in terms of needs for supports at school and access in the community, well, if we look at those the problems underneath there, there could be problems with their speed of processing skills and their planning skills and um, their visual perception and all of those kinds of things 
that they are likely going to impact on driving and and we need to keep them safe we need to keep um, parents safe so like we you know, we don't want them jumping into a car straight away with mum and dad without having assessed their ability because they could they could have an accident that could kill themselves and the, and the person that's in the car with them so yeah. we don't want that to happen we need to go down the safety path and and what and what the law now says as well yeah. Uh, the one thing I just wanted to highlight around that is the law. Um, one thing, this is actually a little, I, 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 this I'm talking, I guess, to maybe the OTs out there that might struggle with this conversation, right? And they're facing those, you know, heavy families that are like, no, this is what we want to do and so on. Mm. Um, this is something I often tell my team um, when they're dealing with difficult customers. I say, look, um, do one easy way you can get on side with your customers is Australians favorite pastime is hating on the government. So what you can do is divert everything to the laws and say, look, it's not me. It's the government yes. that made these rules up. And, and then you kind of have, it's, you're kind of making it not personal, if that makes yeah. sense. So I yeah. think that could be a really good tool for the OTs to give them that confidence to say, look, it's not me, it's the laws. And look, like, like right. you know, this is the sort of thing that we're working off. And I think that could be really, really good for someone as a tool. And, and I guess I say that because uh, I say the hating on the government bit is to give the comfort to the OTs that you probably it'll be an easier conversation because people on the other end will be like, yeah, okay, fine. It's the government. They're already ruining our lives, blah, blah, blah. You know, it'll be like that kind of typical Aussie con conversation. It'll be easier for you to have that conversation than look, sorry, in my medical opinion, I don't think you can drive and blah, blah, blah. Cause they'll try and challenge that. Right. Or, yeah. or if they're a very strong family, but if you go straight to the laws, I think it might be a lot harder for them to challenge that with you. Yeah. But we've got another little line along the same, um, the same thoughts is I'm not the problem. You're not the problem. The problem's the problem. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The law, this, that's the problem. And that's it. And these are the steps that we need to do to, to see if we can work through this. So I think that's the very first thing to understand. And then in terms of, um, Ali, you're asking about how the NDIS funding works and whether you can get support through the NDIS funding is 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 yes, but not, not everything. So um, the way the NJS funding works, and this is this is true for any any person um, that has had a, a medical condition disability that is on the NJS, um, that they can get their driving assessment funded. So that that happens under their improved daily living um, funding out of capacity building. So typically, what happens is that we we get a referral. For someone, so it could be a young a learner, a learner, a pre learner with autism. It could be an older person that's got Parkinson's disease. It could be someone that's had a stroke, um, and we would do a service agreement to let them know what what we anticipate the funding requirements are, uh, and we would get their that person's that client's approval that they've got enough, they've got sufficient funding in their capacity building, improved daily living bucket okay. for yep. the um, OT driving assessment and for, um, you know, if we think that they, we're going to need different number of consults or uh, midway reviews, on-road reviews, if it's a vehicle modification, that consultation time. Um, so so we we do our best in, in my practice at Driving Well to, to let people know what the anticipated costs of OT are going to be from go to woe. Um, and if they've got sufficient funding and if they're happy to proceed, they'll just sign that service agreement. We usually check, like let the let the plan manager, if they're plan managed, we get the plan manager to um, quarantine those funds um, for us. Um, and 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 then then we get going. So in terms of um, getting driving lessons, so it, the NDIS terminology for driving lessons is called specialized. Um, driver training and and that is not automatically funded okay so what the process is to be able to get approval for driving lessons is the person first has to do the OT driving assessment so that would be the clinical and the practical on-road part with the OT driver assessor and the driving instructor the specialized instructor for the assessment and we would um our recommend, you know, we work out what our recommendations are for that person. And if the recommendations do include a specialized driving training program, we would get the quote from the driving instructor and send our report and the quote into the NDIS. And then they actually have to approve the driving lessons. 
And the reason for that is because specialised driver training is what's called a stated item or a quote required item in the NDIS. So you cannot get that automatically in your plan. You need to have the driving assessment first and then submit the driving OT will submit their report and quote into the NJS and it needs to be, it goes into the queue. It, some people wait a week, some people wait a year. It's very inconsistent. Um, squeaky will get to the grease in my in my experience. Uh, take that bit of advice, everybody. All right. <laughs> Just <laughs> go back and rewind that. Squeaky uh, will get to uh, the grease. If you're waiting on funding, the uh, the squeaky hinge gets the oil. That's uh I also that's, like that's to say the, the the friendly pest as well, you know. Yeah, yeah. oh absolutely friendly so, pest. So, so don't be don't be rude. Going. Don't just be rude. wondering how it's going. Yeah, yeah, just yeah wondering right. how it's going. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I always I always tell uh people be very, very friendly. Don't be because yes. it's it gets very easy to be rude, but when you're very friendly, that's so much more squeaky and so much more annoying to the people on the other end. Because yeah. they can't easily hang up on you. They're like, Oh, this guy's being so friendly, you know, yeah. like they're much more likely to help. That's for yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 But just just to recap on what you're saying there is that you might have funds in your capacity building, yes. but they but you need to have additional funds added in hmm. to be able to utilize for specialized driver training yes. and it's the same like mods in a car as well it's the same process you've got to apply yeah for more government funding for the for driving okay yeah. so uh everybody the assessment you can get out of your capacity building for the ot mm -hmm. elements but for the specialized driver training and for car well, mods listens. same yeah. thing you've we've got to as ot's we're helping you apply for more funding so how do you do that, Jenny? How do you understand, and this is getting back to your assessment batteries and so forth and what you've brought in um, with your consulting with America and so forth. How are you helping OTs and parents and, and people with autism and, and learning difficulties and so forth? How are you learn, uh, assisting them to apply for that funding? What assessments and so forth uh, are you doing now to to help with that assessment process oh I'll, I'll come right back to that in a moment brand so with with the lessons i was just going to say um they and particularly with this autism population NDIS haven't given us a guideline around the number of lessons so that's one of the really really difficult things as a driving ot and a conversation that our driving ot communities have within our um our state-based groups and and then when we we, we catch up with our interstate colleagues um, quite often, how many lessons are you applying for? How many lessons are you seeing get, getting approved? Um, so, and, and then we know that uh, most states, you know, you have got a minimum um, supervised driving hours that, that you need, that um, any um, learner any driver, driver needs to do. Yeah, any so, driver, any anyone getting that, going through that learner process. Yeah. Yeah. has a certain amount of hours that they have yeah. to achieve for experience before yeah. they can actually uh, be allocated a licence. That's right. So in Queensland, that's 100 hours. I think in New South Wales, it's 120. Yep. Brad? Yeah, 120 in New South Wales and 75 in South Australia. Yeah, yeah. So again, state-based differences, it would be nice for all the same. So there here, is here it can vary as well. The problem here is yeah. that um, they may shift it based on the assessment as well mm. um and and unfortunately i mean i don't know if this is the same in other states i'm guessing it is because it can be the quirk of the government mm. it, it it depends on who you see on the day <laughs> that that sometimes there, there is guidelines but then what happens is when you go it, it's a very um when it comes to the disability side of things generally it's pretty consistent um but because there's a quite a manual process and you have to go in um we get a lot of feedback of a lot of weird things that happen at the office by the person who makes a call on the day wow. um so so yeah there's it's a, it's a little bit um in new south i think they're making it better but in new south wales it it's they've got guidelines um but they they they're, they're very flexible. well it, here is one of the issues that they've had in new south wales um they've made it so the person at the registry makes the call wow yeah 
So Don't it's it's really their surprising. responsibility. So it's basically the person on the day in the registry, mm -hmm. and the idea behind it, the, the the philosophy or the idea behind it is like the manager of the registry will be involved, and they're keeping it consistent, and they're talking to the other managers, but that doesn't necessarily happen in real world. So so that is one of the quirks of New South Wales is you go to what this this service New South Wales office, which is kind of like all of our services in one place you can go there and you would get um, licenses and when it's things like disability it's got to be manually done and you go there and you put in your assessment and then the decision is made on the spot by that person in the registry mm. generally speaking it should be like a tick box thing and you should be all good if you've done everything but you could get someone that's got a bad mood or had a disabled uncle or had someone you know what i mean like had some story and then that throws everything off and then what happens though then it gets into the industry and they go, oh, this must be the new rules or this is how we have to do things mm. and it causes confusion. Mm, mm. All right. Yeah. So check with your local state and yeah. check yeah. with your OTs and check with your advisors, the the people that are in the know. Make sure that But it is the 120 out. hours. You're like stated it is the 120 here. Yeah. And um, so and then the research that has been done in this in this area from from that research we know that it can take some young people with autism it can take them up to three times as long to to learn to be a driver so you know 300 hours <laughs> to be so and that 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 that's some um, supervised driving hours to go and do your piece test is a minimum it's not a maximum it's minimum so mm -hmm. um so there's no way no way, no way, no way that NDIS, a government department, is going to be able to fund 100 hours of training because that would cost $10,000, right? Yeah. It's never going to be a, a reality. So while well, NDIS hasn't given us, a, a, there's no there's no cap um, at the moment in terms of the number of lessons that they'll provide, but we have to think what is what is reasonable and necessary. So we're, we're more taking the approach that, um, we we find that um, young people that are showing us that they do have potential to be learning to drive and are ready now. I'm going to come and talk about that that um, that answers Brad's question just a moment ago. Um, we find that we we're getting around a block of twenty lessons, and then usually an on road reassessment, and then possibly one more block of ten to twenty lessons, and then that's about it in terms of what the end is. is usually willing to fund and what's and don't you know don't quote me on that it's going to be there's going to be different circumstances and different scenarios yeah. for everyone but that's the approximation um and and it's you know it's it, it does we do need to answer to the um reasonable and necessary criteria in the NDIS Act so sometimes we'll um our our report will get through no questions asked and then the next person will say say no it's an everyday expense and it doesn't it, so it doesn't say that in the price guide that so specialized driving training is in the price guide and there's nothing in the price guide that says it's an everyday expense it's just some of the planners have taken it upon themselves to say well it is an everyday expense and we have to explain that well no for this particular young person an everyday driving instructor is not skilled to be able to provide them the training that they they need to be successful they don't. They aren't able to adapt. They they are verbal, and these young people don't understand verbal, um, and they um, aren't, uh, don't understand how to break the tasks down. And what we what the end result of of that often is, you know, people going with regular instructors is that we then see them. Sometimes we see young people on their very first drive. Sometimes we see them. They've done 10, 20, 30, 50, 70 hours with a driving instructor. And we see them for an assessment and they're terrible. They don't have the skills of, of being able to be a driver. Does, so the, the, can I just ask, the sorry to interrupt. Is it a, teaching is, them wrong. It, sorry to interrupt. The regular instructors have controls in their cars. I'm just, yes. oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Uh, so it's like a specialized instructor with controls. Cause I was thinking how on earth are you going to get into the thing without controls? So yeah, yeah no, they still have controls, but the specialized instructors just done that has has got more understanding about yeah yeah okay yeah. I, I think i know what you're talking say, about say but they've been to a course and they work with the occupational therapist so they've been to the potential drive training and they've they've got more yeah. more up there um they're better place to be able to teach them in the way that these young people need to be taught to be successful but the thing is is they're not really involved in this whole process of the assessment so if they're going down the wrong path it could just be 
a lot of wasted time, right? Is that what you're saying? So regular instructors, yeah, are not are not involved. And so if people start down the path of a regular instructor, you know, it could be that they come to us having having wasted thousands of dollars on yeah, so yeah, instructor yeah, yeah. and need to start from scratch. And we need to kind of unteach and reteach um, through with a specialized instructor. We've got one young lady at the moment. She's 24. She's done, you know, her her hundred hours and then some, and she's gone for her driving test five times and failed. Yeah, and this is a that's... young woman that has definitely is going to be able to be a driver, but she's just been taught things incorrectly. And then she's she's um uh, the assessment showed that she was missing a lot of the she didn't realize pedestrians were important to pay attention to yeah, um, okay. and she's missing speed signs and things so she just hasn't been taught in the right way um so yeah it's, it's and, been and, a long and that's not so, that's not a one-off by the way mm-hmm. like that's one example of many that jenny and myself and and the other driver ot's would would see out there so uh if you are struck if you're listening to this as a parent or as as somebody with uh autism or something you're, you're not alone Mm-hmm. Um, and we, there are elements out there that we, uh, that there are things out there that we can do to assist. So, um, spinning it back to that question yeah. that I asked earlier, Let's tell you about the what potential type of drive. things are there? Yeah. So the potential to drive assessment. So that, that is the, the, the approach of the driving assessment for this learner population. And we can do it for a pre-learner driver as well. So there might be 15 and um, that are thinking, oh, I'm not sure if they're going to be able to be a driver. And we can do the same approach for this, um, for that young person before getting their learner's permit. So we still, um, it's it's sort of same for, for people that we were familiar with a OT driving assessment it's it's same same but different as I, I like to explain so we still have a clinical assessment and that's where we go through and we talk about that per- young person's medical history and talk to them about their schooling and their learning strategies and challenges and triggers and what their interests and hobbies are um, that often helps us create a, a nice rapport um, and if, you know if they get anxious about anything what sort of their triggers are um, and then we go through and do some cognitive assessments that look at their um, visual motor integration skills. So that's a fancy way of saying their ability to coordinate what they see with what they do. So if you think about catching a ball, you need to see the ball coming at you and you need to be able to then coordinate your hand movements to physically catch it. Same thing with driving. We're using that skill all the time with driving. We need to be able to see a corner or a bend in the road and coordinate our hands to move the steering wheel to coordinate around the bend. So if our visual motor integration skills are reduced, being in the car, physically controlling the car is probably going to be a bit challenging. Okay, so we look at that and then we look at speed of processing skills Um, And then we do a bit of teaching in that clinical part of the assessment. So we start to introduce this concept of critical items. So these are the critical things that we have to pay attention to on the roadway. So all things like an experienced driver would think is common sense, like uh, giveaway signs, stop signs, traffic lights, pedestrians, brake lights and indicator lights of other cars around us, et cetera, et cetera. Um, So we we teach a bit of that and um, and then... um, look at and and do a bit of a hazard perception test then as well. So show them different traffic photos and can they identify um, what they've learnt, those critical items on the photos. Um, So that's basically the clinical part of the assessment. Um, And in my practice, we do that on on one appointment and then we come back for the second appointment and we do the the practical part. In between that, we actually also get um, the um, usually the parents to do a life skills checklist for us. So this is one of the huge parts of this assessment approach is that we're actually looking at the young person's life skills as um, not, not, not predictors for, but we're looking at evidence of um, what we call operational skill ability, tactical skill ability, and strategic skill ability. So think about tactical skills. That is um, what we, we use our tactical skills in driving all the time. Uh, And that's when we use our our planning and problem solving whilst we're driving to respond to hazards and sudden unexpected things on the roadway. So a car's um, pulled in front of you, for example, or a child's run out um, in front of you on the road. We need to be able to, on the spot, plan and problem solve and react to that. 
So we can look at um, our, our, our life skills to see if we've got, if that young person's got some evidence of those kinds of um, planning and problem solving skills in their general life mm -hmm. skills. So we've got a really beautiful questionnaire that's been developed by, um, uh, actually I can't remember who it was developed by initially, University of Washington, I'm wanting to say, but it's also been adapted just um, last mm -hmm. year by Dr. Mary Monaghan and some of her colleagues over in America um, to help us score up basically where people are at with their um, operational, tactical and strategic life skills and what I mean by life skills is um um yeah, what kind of questions do you have to ask yeah so oh uh, so it's just a it's a tick and flick questionnaire and it goes through different sections of of life skills so there's a section on interpersonal skills there's a section on um, co um, cooking and kitchen skills there's a section on um, home and family responsibilities and my favorite section is the community um, mobility life skills. So questions like, are they able to be a pedestrian and cross the, cross the street with a pedestrian crossing? Can they cross the street without a pedestrian crossing? Can they ride a bike? Can they um, catch public transport? Can they make a shopping list? Can they find a few things off a shopping list in a grocery shop? Can they ask best. for help? Just saying, best thing. That, yeah. that section, yeah. uh, as a parent, yeah. Have and I'm like, I'm like even without being an OT, if you're going, mm -hmm. is this the right thing? Should we even contemplate an OT assessment? Yeah. Just ask yourself, are they able to be in the community? Yes. Somewhat independent. Yeah. And can they can they independently leave leave the house? Mm. Can they even be alone somewhere? in the house? Can they be right. alone in the house? Yeah. Yeah. Can they be alone in the house? Another great, yeah, another great. What about, um, what about to add to that, which I don't know if this comes in, in your job and I'm interested to know, because I've got this on a personal level, someone that I know, hmm. the parent doesn't want to let them be independent, even though they may hmm. be able to be. So, oh, so there's, absolutely. does that make sense? So, so when you said the crossing of the road, I know a boy who, He's 19 and his parents have never even let him try to cross the road, if that yeah. makes sense, because they're so scared. Yeah. Um, and there's so many other things as well. And I'm just wondering if that also plays into part of it. Oh, absolutely. A parent can definitely underreport or not have given that young person opportunities for that skill development. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And it's the the checklist is a really beautiful way for um for parents to kind of obviously rate their young person's current skill level, but also show them, well, these are the things that you could be working on. So, you know, yeah. we might not be ready for driving right now, but perhaps we're going to be ready in the future. And these are all the kinds of things that that you need to support them and, and give them opportunities to develop those skills. Because, hey, if we can't cross the street as a pedestrian, do you reckon we can drive? Yeah. No. No, no, no. Because, yeah. you know, think about driving is, you know, one of the key things that we do as a as a driver is we've got to um, be able to enter it into an intersection. And to be able to enter into, into an intersection, we've got to scan, we've got to know what the rules are, we've got to know what we're looking for, and we've got to have that, that processing and that sort of sense of um, anticipating a, a gap and then go, take the gap. Yeah. Predicting and what others are going to do is, is sometimes the, very... Yeah. It can be really difficult in, yeah. in this diagnostic group is yeah. predicting what others are going to do yeah. uh, in a safe and meaningful way um, a rather than waiting task. for nothing. It's a nonverbal communication task. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very, I mean, it, it's just, yeah, it, even in my own personal thing, I recently just was thinking about it and I was thinking it's so interesting as humans we display so much emotion towards a metal box. Um, yeah. we, we, we sit inside a metal box and then we spray so much emotions to this other metal box. Yeah. And, and, and it, sometimes I've just think, you know, it's so interesting that we can get so emotional about it, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it is, it's a very emotive, um, part of our lives, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, it's just, we just need to be aware of that. Yeah. People ask, uh, you know, your, your podcast goes for so long. Um, can you reduce the length <laughs> of your podcast? But no. I, I think we could talk to you for another hour, Jenny. But yeah, yeah I was thinking the... that I think we need to maybe um, I wouldn't mind breaking your process down a little bit and maybe doing podcasts on the process, because I think even just this um, 
just this initial part about the funding we could talk <laughs> for a while and i actually think that part is pretty important because even the even that whole i got a few things i was writing down even like the whole reasonable and necessary at which point do you technically go reasonable and necessary because do you as an ot how can you predict for example like what i'm thinking is if you've got someone in front of you um are you how can you tell the future as an ot like if this person is definitely not going to be able to drive or not and if that's the case then is it reasonable and necessary to even try assessment you know what i mean so it's getting like into a really kind of complicated thing and i wouldn't mind other um ot's to hear about that you know and and even uh, uh, and even people like myself who are in the industry because then i think we would get less let's say frustrated at ot's because we're like hey why aren't they just approving the quote why don't they just buy the product you know and and when you hear how much is going on in the background then you go okay well that's why the ot is so concerned and getting so many complicated issues when i'm just the automotive guy going just buy the product already you know what i mean so it, it's really good for me to also hear all of that stuff yeah i think there's um you know my my philosophy really is that everyone's got the right to be assessed and it's you know the other other professionals that are involved in the situation it's not their area of expertise whereas from a driving ot like that's our that's our little area of expertise we've we've got the clinical skill we've got the years of um assessment and and training and um you know aware of the interventions like it's it's that's our that's that's the one thing I know how to do, Ali. So. Yeah, yeah, that's our dedicated so. <laughs> brain space. That is yeah. our dedicated yeah. brain space. Is where yeah. we, you know, when we um, go home at night and you're, you're bored, I don't know about you, Jenny, but I go and think about the clients that we've seen today and yeah. go, huh, and, and I'm still constantly and thinking and analyzing and, and, and trying to figure yeah. it out. That's our brain space. That's what we do. Yeah. yeah. So, so to have another, like a, a non-driving OT professional sort of put a limit on someone and not let them have an opportunity to have an assessment. Yeah, it'd be pretty yeah. annoying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, but I it's, feel- it's good. Like, like I said, that's why it's really great having this conversation um, and breaking I'd, all this down. Because I'd then- be really happy to have a, a, a part two, but I, I um, in terms of a getting into some things in a bit more detail but I just wanted to tell you the second part of the potential drive assessment yeah, yeah, yeah. So we talked we have the clinical part we have the life skills part and then the third well the third part well the second face-to-face component is um, the practical on-road assessment um, that is still the OT driver assessor the drive, specialized driving instructor the client and the parent parents got to be involved the whole way through um, but the key difference, um, so we, remember when I, I said earlier what we used to do um, was we used to get that young person straight behind the wheel and expect them to <laughs> do most things. So we don't do that. We we actually get them in as the front passenger. So the driving instructor is driving the car and the client, which is the learner driver, is the front passenger and OT driver assessor and parent or, or you know key support worker Uh, in the back and we actually are breaking down um, elements of the driving task and we're getting them to do teaching that to the client but also getting them to to try and do those things one at a time and then in a scaffolded way build up those those skills to see if they're able to do this part of driving this part of driving this part of driving this part of driving and it just is incredibly reduces that overwhelm as the OT driver says, it lets me say, do they understand this bit? Yeah. Do they understand this bit? Mm, not really. Do they understand this bit? Yeah, they did all right. And it just gives me such a better picture about each of those set areas and their strengths and challenges and their learning. So it actually allows them to learn in the assessment. Um, and it's just been the absolute most game changer in, in the way we, we do this overall assessment. So we just to compare, we do it slightly different um, at Williams OT, that on-road bit, very similar elements of breaking it down into to, to their smallest components first and, and looking at their potential to learn small things because uh, other other 16-year-olds with uh, without a neurodiversity mm-hmm. might be able to take on lots of information, figure mm-hmm. out lots of things all at once and be able to make that into a practical element and drive mm. where 
we need to quite often we're Jenny, correct me if I'm wrong, discovering the best way that the person actually learns. Some some are verbal, some are uh, more often than not um, a visual learner. Yeah, so they need absolutely. to see it. They need to watch you doing yep. it and go, okay, yep. I can see your hands do this and I can see your hands do that. And you have to draw their attention to your hands doing this and your feet doing that. And watching is going to make a massive difference compared to do this, do that verbally. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, I, I find that quite often in those first drives, you're looking at learning potential and, and what's yeah. the best way of learning. And you're chunking that into very bite-sized elements um, rather <laughs> yeah. than, yeah, you're not giving them the whole, yeah. uh, the whole lot all at once. You, you've really got to break it down into its small components and, and look at their ability to learn. Yeah, and the potential to drive approach that um, Dr. Miriam Monaghan has has developed and and published. She's actually um, doing research now with um, a pretty incredible uh, research partner, also in the states, that they're um, looking at standardizing this assessment approach and looking to find if they can get uh, like cut points for some of the standardized clinical like cognitive assessments to say, you know we we found that a score of this and lower is not going to be suitable for driving so mm -hmm. that that research is quite a quite a way off um but really exciting what they're doing um but in terms of the passenger activities and 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 doing them you know one skill one at a time and and what the skills that i'm talking about are lane position awareness and then we do a, a, um, we look at their visual searching skills by so that crit the critical items that we taught them earlier, we're getting them to look for the critical items, but one at a time whilst, whilst we're driving. And then we scaffold that up and, and um, build up that skill. Then we do gap selection, which is, you know, just, you know, when is it safe to go that they've got to be the looker and the decision maker. And then we do a problem solving task. So they've got to be able to step through and sequence by telling the driving instructor what all the steps are that they've got to be able to pull over in an emergency so we, we teach them that we don't you know we don't expect them to do it off the cuff we teach it to them and then are they able to repeat that and, and improve with their performance so where one of the main things like just exactly what brad said about you know looking for that ability to learn it's are they are they coachable can we coach them are they responding to those bits of feedback from the instructor are they starting to put a few things together um and yeah, and Brad mentioned about the learning styles and, yeah, it's not going to be the same for everyone, but the research does show that um, autism in particular tends to be a visual learner. So they need to be able to see diagrams. They need to be able to see how things are done. They don't do well with just verb, like most of them don't, don't do as well with um, excessive instructions um, or... They're, uh -huh. they're driving the and the driving instructors talking to them at the same time. Yeah. That quite often is not going to work. And mm -hmm. that's how a lot of driving instructors work. Mm -hmm. So yeah. they're driving yeah. down a straight road. Now's the time to give you feedback on the last corner. Yeah. It just, it just doesn't sink in because they need to see it. They need to be pulled over. They need to be able to give the attention to the visual that you might be drawing on a pad. So that they've just done because they also have they often have trouble generalizing across to different situations. So mm -hmm. they might have done this roundabout, which is a four ways roundabout, and they've gone straight ahead. But the next roundabout is a three ways or a five ways and they've gone right or they've done a U a U turn and it's same steps that we would do, but it, they just often struggle to generalize those contexts. Yeah, yeah. That, that mental flexibility. I, I look, uh, Jenny. We could <laughs> so so many things that we could talk about uh, that I'm sure parents and driving instructors and OTs could learn about. But um, I think we're coming up to an hour, and we're meant to talk to you for about 20 minutes. So <laughs> we have gone. I'm sorry to all the listeners if you're going. Ah, oh, why why are they so talking for so long? But um, as you can see, we're passionate about this area. There's the last so nugget. The last really yeah, go cool, go cool go on. That I yeah. would. Push but we will get out is is that um so yeah this this big whole process of what what can you do in the meantime so as as mm -hmm. parents as OTs 
what can you do in the meantime? So Excellent. You stole my, my last question. You stole my last question. Anyway, oh, sorry, so go, for it. go for it. <laughs> so go to my website, drivingwrong.com.au and go to our learning hub. So there's, um, we've put together a couple of different courses that are there that you can go to for more information. But the, so that's a pretty good gold nugget, but the best gold nugget is the Drive Focus app. Okay. This is a really, really exciting tablet based um, and Windows 11. Now it's just been released on Windows 11. Um, a tab, um, an app that, that helps develop that information processing cycle that we need for driving. So the information processing cycle is that we've got our vision and our, our visual search and a, and a stimulus, and then we need to make a decision and process that in our brain, and then we need to action or do the decision. So an example would be we've got a yellow traffic light up ahead. We need to see and know it's important to pay attention to. And then our decision is we remember the road rules, remember our calm behavior, we judge how far away we are, is, is we look at our rear vision mirror, is there anyone behind us, what's my decision, I'm going to slow down and come to a stop. And then our action is that we take our foot off the accelerator onto the brake and gently stop at the line, right? So that's information processing cycles, what we're doing constantly as a driver. So the Drive Focus app has been developed based on that body of evidence um, to allow you to practice that skill outside of a car environment altogether. So you've got your tablet in your kitchen and your lounge room or your Windows 11, it's now clickable and tappable, that you've got those, those same critical items that, that we've been talking about. And there's videos um, that are recorded and, the, and you've got a tap on all the critical items as you see them. So um, it's, it's recorded and... Um, the videos are recorded in you know real time, so it's you know same as if you were driving in a in a car. Um, and there's different features on the app that you can you can slow it down if you're if that person's struggling with the speed of the app, you can actually slow the drive down to an eighty percent and a sixty percent time. Um, and then when you finish the drive, it um, it breaks down all your scores, so you can go and look at what review your score and see how many. Um, apps see how many critical items that you got see what you missed and you can actually let, lets you go back into that section of the video to see oh you missed that stop sign let's go and look at where that was in the video and it got, takes you back into that section of the video um it's gamified so there's different um you start at level one and you can work your way up to from like a low demand traffic through to higher demand traffic um and the best thing about the app is that once you um buy it there's no ongoing fees so it's a once-off cost it costs about about 20 22 dollars australian um and once you've bought bought it no ongoing fees and any updates that they do to the app you get automatically um and you've got it for life then and it is, is that a, a, yeah. something developed here or no it it's a, it's american but yeah. we actually collaborated with so it's developed again by dr mary monaghan and her team and colleagues over in the states um, and that was one of the other actions that we did at the start of lockdown is that we worked together to Australianize the app. So yeah. when you buy the app, you've got all of these American and Canadian cities, but they're on the wrong side of the road. So yeah. we actually have Brisbane and Melbourne. And within Brisbane and Melbourne, there are seven videos in each city oh, that yeah. levels you up through through that um, that that visual search and reaction time skill. Um, so it's pretty pretty exciting, and we um, we're actually we're finalist in the Australian Disability Service Awards last year for best technology product in oh, yeah. in the Drive Focus app and the work that we did, and and um, in the in 2021 um, we were the winner of the technology category for all of that work in bringing the the Drive Focus app to Australia. So that was pretty pretty exciting. So. Um, I think, you know, parents um, and OTs that have got young people facing this goal, um, the Drive Focus app is going to be one of the, one of your most um, useful, um, easy-to-access tools that's going to be really helpful in developing those skills. That's really Awesome, good. Jenny. Absolutely awesome. So thank you very much for coming on. We're going to ask you one final question in a second, but before we do that, just a a shout out to our sponsors that make this show possible, Mobility Engineering and Williams OT. Um, we ask every participant uh, this question. So we're not gonna let you go before asking you this question as well. Uh, we know 
that for our clients, uh, driving is more than just getting from A to B. What's something that's meaning and special for you that you've used your car for, uh, whether it's a special mm -hmm. trip or an adventure or, or something maybe not so uh, <laughs> well behaved, something a little bit fun or stupid, uh, something that you've done in a car that's meaningful for you? Oh, um, slightly different to the question that I prepared, Brad. Um, the, the most meaningful thing to me is I'm a, I'm a mum and a business owner and without my car, I, I can't do either of those things. So we, you know, I've already been this morning to Pilates. I've dropped my husband off at his prac. I've dropped my son off at school. My daughter's homesick. I'm about to go drop her off and I'm about to go out um, and do um, a, a client assessment. So. <laughs> You know, all, all of the things that a, a mum and business owner um, does need to and want to do in her life. So I'm, yeah, I'm very, very grateful for my car. And, and my car is, um, I, I dread um, our my Wednesdays because we do a driving clinic on Wednesday where I practice passenger activities with some of my young, young people and I've got to make sure my car is clean. Um, <laughs> and it's got all of the things in the car. So that that is... Um, so, I, you know, if any of my clients are listening, apologies <laughs> for seeing me tidying up my car. Um, but actually what I was going to tell you is that um, I, um, I, I I mainly have experience driving a car, but I, I do have my HR license. As You know, Brad, we did the heavy vehicle training together, so I got my HR license to understand what it's like for injured truckies getting back to driving and, Gosh, that was terrifying doing that process with the with the um, driving examiners. Um, so I have can empathise with my clients that are going through the test process. And I I had a goal a few years ago to to um, be able to drive some different, just have a, opportunities and experience in driving different vehicles. And I was able to um, tick one of those off my list. Um, we went to Bali on holidays in July this year, and I got to ride a quad bike. Yeah. Uh, which I've never done before, um, but we went through the rainforest up and down these huge gullies and through a cave and a waterfall. And it was um, going down the hills was terrifying. I thought I was going to fall <laughs> over the front of the handlebars, but um, and had my daughter on the back. Um, but oh gosh, it was just, it was wonderful, it's thrilling. Yeah. And it, yeah. And it was, I was really, I felt just really blessed that I am able to be a driver. Mm. Jenny, it's absolutely wonderful to have you on uh, the Drive Able podcast. Um, I I know a lot about uh, driving well in regards to knowing you from afar, but you know, knowing you for many years and so forth. But also your work in this potential to drive space for for kids with autism is absolutely inspiring. Thank you very much for Thanks, all the Brad. work that you're doing uh, in this area because I'm learning from you as well so uh look a massive shout out to you and everything that you're doing in this space really thank you for coming on like you said um, we, thank you oh that's all right we um it's, <laughs> yeah it's, it's absolutely true we i uh, hope that the listeners got something out of this as well yeah, um and then they can uh, go onto the driving well website and maybe explore and search for a little bit more um and yeah we just want to say a massive uh, shout out if you've got any questions as well for Jenny, make sure that you make, make a comment wherever you're getting this uh, podcast from. Uh, we check in on those regularly just to make sure that, you know, we're keeping up to date. If you've got any questions, um, put them down in the uh, below the show notes in, in the comments and feedback section. Uh, we'll pass them on. Jenny, is is the website the best place to, to find you? Have you got yeah. any other places where they could find you if they've got questions? Oh, we're on Facebook uh, as well. Um, but, yeah, the website's got all of the information and we've got really comprehensive information about the process and how the anti funding works and what's involved in the potential drive assessment and um, the life skills checklist is on there and all of the links to the courses that we've put together as well so the website would be the best place so just that website again www.drivingwell.com.au excellent jenny <laughs> thank you very much for all your time stick around everybody Ali and I are going to do a very reduced top three takeaway because of the time that's uh, been spent already uh, with you yourself, Jenny. We thank you very much for all your time. Good luck uh, squeezing in the shortened time that you've got for cleaning your car for your clients this <laughs> afternoon. Uh, wish you all the very best and thank you very much for all your time. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Jenny. Awesome. Thanks. 
All right, welcome back. So that was an awesome interview. Uh, in this section, we bring you our expert analysis and top three takeaways from that interview. This is where we provide more about, uh, well, provide our more than 30 years of ex joint experience in the industry, helping people with disabilities to drive and get out in the community in a safe and meaningful way. And yeah, like I said, that was, um, I was excited before the episode and I'm even more excited now. And I, uh, as we discussed offline, I wouldn't mind doing even more with Jenny. I think she's great. And just listening to her speak and the passion and the, the knowledge. Um, yeah, you can just speak to her for ages. So that's really good. And so, yeah, um, and I'm sure you share that as well, Brad. And on that, um, what are the lessons? All right. So, yeah, absolutely. Love love speaking uh, with Jenny. Uh, yeah, and what she's doing for the industry is huge. But one of the first top three takeaway, and this is uh, one of the little researchy areas that it's really important to note. And I want to put this one out there for any OTs that are listening, any parents that are listening, any clients with ASD or, or learning disabilities, but especially the NDIS is that research has shown that it can take up to three times as long as the typical teenager to learn how to drive. Three times as long. So even if we uh, look at 100 hours as a round figure across all the states, 75 in South Australia, 100 in, in, uh, in Queensland, 120 in New South Wales, uh, I don't know how they get those numbers and why they're so different. But let's just make 100 a round figure. That's 300 hours of experience before someone may be ready to get their license. That's a huge number. Um, and it's something that NDIS really needs to be aware of. And, you know, uh, Jenny said it, it was not fair or reasonable to expect NDIS to pay for 300 hours. And, yeah. and two chunks of about 40 hours is fair and reasonable. I'm just going to add a little bit onto it. I wanted to do it in the podcast, but I'm going to add a little bit onto it. You and I learning to drive, Ali, we don't pay for a hundred hours worth of lessons. Okay. We would, a, a typical learner may pay for around 10 to 20 hours out of their own pocket. That needs to be strongly considered to be paid out of your own pocket with a driving instructor. If you've got ASD. Yeah the rest of it is additional to that okay yeah. it's on top of that that we're applying for okay so just be aware but it could take your child more than 100 hours to get their license and that needs to be strongly strongly considered by all the people involved yeah and so then, yeah yeah i was just gonna say we're trying to keep this nice and short but if you've got any questions make sure you put them in the in the comments below then that takes us on to our second dot point. Do you want to uh, talk about this one? Uh, yeah, Ali? yeah. So I thought that was a really, really good idea. Um, the life skills checklist, uh, that's um, just around the life skills. Not only, like as Brad said um, in the interview, he highlighted that it's very important and, and, you know, he's sort of seen how important it is on the field and in the clinical um, area. But just as a mum and dad, I think it's extremely important because it gives that reality check of where your child actually is. Now, you know, I, I um, have worked in this industry quite a many years, but I also work very much so in the like child transport industry. Um, and one of the things when we are parents and even just being a parent myself, and I know you're a parent, Brad, you are it's just natural. You're desperate for your child to progress. You know, you're desperate for your child to advance, you know, and you're so proud, you know, they're driving now and they're doing this now and they're walking now and they're, you know, they've got this degree or they've achieved this and you, you go and tell all your friends and your family. And that's just, that's part of life. It's nature, you know? And, and so it's very easy to get um, caught up in that also uh, with, the, you know, uh, I guess with, with a child with a disability, you need a bit more, a bit more awareness, I guess, of their general skills and understanding. You maybe are with with an able-bodied child or non-disabled child, you might take a lot for granted. To be honest, just a little side note: often I look at some of my clients and the parents of the clients, and you know what I think as a parent? I think you are a much better parent than I am because you pay so much more attention to your child and you can see so much more of your child than I will ever see of my child because I see that they have to, you know, spend so much, they don't take their children for granted. And I do, you know, and, and it's nature, you know, and so it's really interesting. Um, 
within that space, you're spending so much time with your child, you need to really understand how they work on a quote end quote everyday life skills basis when people are taking things for granted, like, you know, myself. So, so, and, and I think going through that checklist really helps the parents and the OTs and the kids all come to one point where they can all have a point of agreement, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's like an objective tool and you're not looking through the love colored eyes, if that makes sense of the mum and dad. Yeah. Look, uh, parents can be overprotective as well. Um, And just relating that to driving really quickly is that if a client can't cross a road without traffic lights, without pedestrian crossing lights, are they going to be able to drive? Because I'm going to relate it to driving and some of the early decision makings that we make. You need roughly the same amount of gap to drive a car. If you turn left and get a car out on the road, you need the same gap as what you would to walk across one lane of, of road. We are one, one meter around. A car, as pictured in behind me, is about six metres worth of length. I can walk at about 5Ks. The car can get up to speed, up to 50Ks really quickly. But because it's bigger, it's a big chunk of metal. I'm only small. It's about the same amount of space. So if I can walk across one lane of traffic, I can get a car out into one lane of traffic. So being able to learn to cross the road is actually absolutely vital. You don't wait for the road to be completely bare with no traffic whatsoever. Otherwise you will never cross the road. You need to learn about gap selection um, before you can actually put a car out into that uh, area. And, yeah. you know, that, having that as one of the life skills checklist is, is absolutely vital. And it relates very closely to being independent in a car. Absolutely yeah. vital. Um, and and so. in a car, it's a very, very, like Jenny said, very complex environment. Oh, um, yeah. And so, and life is a complex environment. So it, you can kind of, by assessing how someone is doing in life, um, you'll be able to get a really good shot of how they'll actually handle that environment within the car. And and I think that's the perfect, so, I guess, segue to that next point around the app to get that practice and that, yeah. that understanding in the assessment process. Yeah, that drive focus app, uh, also available on Windows now, she said. That drive focus app is something that you can practice at home. You can You can go, what's important? Another little snippet to take away as a parent, if you're listening to this, is that there's a million signs on the road nowadays. You've got shop signs, you've got bus stops, you've got bike lanes, you've got all kinds of things. The signs that a driver has to do usually have red on them. That's just something that you can teach your child. A giveaway sign has a red line around it. A stop sign's got lots of red. A stop light is red. Um, Most things that you have to do, no entry, no left turn, no right turn, speed sign with a red circle around it, the signs that you have to do as a priority have got red on them. Something as simple as that. So um, the Drive Focus app will help you uh, work with your young person to get them ready of what to focus on with their decision making. Great tool. Uh, we utilize it. You can utilize it. And what did she say? $22 or something like that. So, yeah. yeah uh, and probably right. NDIS um, reimbursable. So, uh, make sure you go onto the, the Driving Well website. We're going to keep it really short. We're going to cut it off there. As we wind up this uh, episode, we'll just do a shout out to our sponsors that make this show possible uh, Mobility Engineering and Williams OT for helping you bring. Uh, This episode with Jenny today, Williams OT is a driver assessments and rehab, offers all the pieces of the puzzle to assist people with disabilities reach their driving and community mobility goals. And Mobility Engineering is a team of passionate and dedicated people focused on bringing Australia's largest range of suitable transport solutions for all walks of life. And as we say in every episode, especially this one as well, the advice provided in this podcast is general in nature. So if you've got any queries about what will uh, work for you, make sure you get in contact with your local driving OT or mobility dealer and set yourself up with trials and assessments because those trials and assessments really do put you in that driver's seat. That's Um, it. it. Thanks, mate. All right. Thanks very much. We'll see you in the next episode. Thanks for listening to the Drive Able Podcast with Brad Williams and Ali Akbarian. If you like what you've heard, make sure you like, rate, and subscribe. It really does make a massive difference. If you or anyone you know
would like to share a story about driving with a disability, or you would like to get in contact, find the show notes, or find the resources mentioned in this episode, you can find us on Facebook. Just search at Drive Able Podcast for more information.